what I'm getting to do right now. <laughs> this is a really cool experience because this is the first time at a Comic Con that all three of these guys have been together for a Boy Meets World panel. <laughs> So you don't want to hear from me, you want to see these guys. So without further ado, the stars of Boy Meets World, Ben Savage, Ryder Smith, Chris Savage. And some of those, and then all the dramatic stuff too, you know, like 
just the, the, Sean's whole life, it was so dramatic. <laughs> and I, you know, it was like a, if we had been like a more popular sort of mainstream sitcom, I think there would have been pressure to like, ah, oh, lighten up a little, guys. Uh, but because of that, I think that's part of why it endures is that, you know, it has this sort of cold feeling that people are like, this isn't a sitcom. And, and, and it lodges into your memory and then you revisit it when you're older and you're like, oh yeah, they, they were yeah, exactly some stuff. serious stuff. I still love how your character was an alcoholic for like 16 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> like half of one episode, he drank like half a bottle of like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Essentially, especially towards the later half of the show, Eric was just me. <laughs> I hate to say that, but it's true. Whereas these guys were really not like their characters. But I mean, you guys were, you know what I mean? It was like, I was the goofball, and then, then they'd yell at you, and I was still the goofball, just with different lines. Where you got, you were like, you're way, not, way less angst-ridden than Sean was, and that, you know, you, you weren't quite as Corey as Corey. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know what I mean? It was like you guys like had to like jump into your characters where I was more just like, yeah, let's go play. You know? It was just written that way. Maybe, but they, you know, I mean, Michael, this, it, it, this is this is what's interesting about having done this show. And they know Michael. You guys know Michael. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. Yeah. He's really the, the 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 writer and creator and sort of the the, the most the voice of the show. You know, he was the one who was always like, this way your character. And he, you know, part of what makes him very good at his job is that he would incorporate elements of our real lives and personalities into our characters and sort of you know allow the show to follow those. So I don't know, man. I mean, you know, like Sean suddenly became a poet because Michael yeah, knew that I was yeah. really the poet. Yeah, that was you. And like. Became an alcoholic. So I'm an alcoholic. I mean, <laughs> but you're like from the most stable family in the world. Yes, that's that's true. True. But you know, like all yes. that kind of stuff. Where it was like that was all like, yeah. yeah. But I think they did take uh, characteristics of our personalities or like our interests, and they did incorporate it into our characters. At a certain point, I just became an old man that likes cake. <laughs> yeah, broccoli and broccoli and being married to the Yes, but uh, <laughs> that was my. That was my thing. I don't know. I think the writers just projected a lot of their stuff onto me. But it was also, it was also because you met Topanga the first day of kindergarten. I mean, the sandbox. I mean, when you were 13. <laughs> That's the thing about our show. There's not a lot of continuity. We had two sisters. I mean, it was like I did have two sisters. We did. We had sisters. Yeah. We, the, but also, I think, it was, I think it was a different era because. Social media wasn't around, yeah. and we didn't even have the internet, which sounds so weird. We just hope you forget. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true, people come up to us now and ask us continuity issues about what happened in 1993. Like, why are we wearing a different shirt? I have no, I was 14 years old. I don't know. They told me to put on a different shirt. I still, my favorite is still that our little brother was a baby, and then the last episode, he was like eight. <laughs> And that was just because Michael Jacobs wanted to put his kid on the show at the end. <laughs> and it was like, oh, you're not, you got Josh drove here today. <laughs> this, this is insider information. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> just keep this between us. Alright, I got a couple, couple more questions. These guys, but I'm going to let you guys start lining up at the uh, microphone. So if you have Already? any questions. Uh, I haven't even given my... Uh, I've got a couple more questions for you. <laughs> well, I'm letting them. That oh, wow. Good. Just, just... What, what are some of your favorite, like, long set stories, things that we might not have seen uh, in front of the camera? The dancing was always fun. The dancing? Yeah. No, no, you go. You, you, no, you, you, you. I'll tell us. So, <laughs> <laughs> there is a, uh, 
there's a Backstreet Boys song. Uh, <laughs> They bring in a live audience, and we get to, you know, and there's there's a lot of interaction with the audience. And how, I mean, do we know how this started? Was it you, Ben? So ben? We just were doing it again. So we just, yeah. you know, so I, it started off, you know, that, that the song was really popular at the time, and uh, it, they, they would play it for the audience, and Ben started doing a dance in front of the audience, and it, it kept building and building until it became this whole choreographed show <laughs> that, that the three of us and Matt Lawrence would do, which culminated in like uh, Will and I doing round off flip flops, about Ben ripping off his shirt, uh, and, and, and it just expanded into that. It was so much fun. I think there is footage of it I think somewhere. There is. We loved it. The, um, the crew kind of didn't because they'd be like, oh, we have to sit here for a half hour and watch you guys dance every night. But uh, yeah, we had a blast. It was for the fans. It was for the fans. And then Matt Lawrence was here. Hey, guys. <laughs> uh, what was the question? <laughs> just some, some stories uh, you have for us. Well, I would just do more of a general comment, which would be that, I again, our show was like family, and uh, I just never stopped laughing for seven years on Women's World. I mean, every day was just so much fun. And uh, I think when you're in that kind of environment, you're allowed to be a lot more creative and to explore a lot more, because you're just, like, your guard is down, you're just having so much fun. So like what Ryder was saying earlier, by the sixth or seventh season, season of the show, we were just kind of doing whatever. I mean, we just kind of like, we would mess around so much on set and they would just start filming. And, but it led to a lot of great stuff. There was a lot of fun stuff, fun to get, so. That's awesome. Does anyone have anything? Yeah. yeah. No? Yeah, more stories. <laughs> no? <laughs> they don't want to hear me talk, they want to hear you talk, so if you have more stories. No, I mean, it was just, he's right, it was an everyday kind of thing. There weren't any specific, like, we get that a lot, like, whether pranks, right? It was just the kind of general camaraderie of just being there with everybody was the best part of the show, I think. You said it last. Alright, so we're going to open up now. Please make it a question, keep it to one question, and no personal hi moms or anything well, like that. Well, we do want to say hi to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just All of your moms have been saying hi to you now, yeah. so you don't have to ask it once you get to the mic. But, uh, <laughs> let's go ahead. I just wanted to say that uh, the kindness of his heart and to support his friends, Dana McNulty, who played Harley Kinder, actually is here. To yeah. 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 yeah! Get out there! Get out there! Harley Kinder, Harley Kinder, he is family and a good man. Since the original movie was born, and yeah. I, was, I just want to say, I, am I allowed to talk? <laughs> no. I want to say just a little fan. When we started Girl Meets World, one of the things that was really important to Danielle and myself and Ryder and Will as well was that we wanted to really make sure that we replicated the experience of Boy Meets World. So we brought back as many people as we could um, to the second series. We did that all the way down from some of the crew members, the original teacher that I had like on set on Boy Meets World, like who helped me with my schoolwork. We brought him in to teach the girls on Boy Meets World. And so we really wanted to replicate the experience. And one of the most special guests that we had was Danny McNulty. We, we, we loved having him on Boy Meets World. And then so when he was able to join us on Boy Meets World, we were just so thrilled to have him. So glad you're here. The nicest movie in the world. <laughs> transition in terms of getting back. I had to put the beard back on. That was a long time. <laughs> That's a long time in makeup. Um, I would just say, I, I think I was a little apprehensive when we started the second series. I was definitely a little like, how am I supposed to play this character now? And am I supposed to be this adult? Or am I supposed to be kind of wacky, funny, Corey? Or uh, what am I supposed to do? But I, I think eventually just everything kind of settled in and, you know, the writers figured out how to write for us properly and we figured out how to handle the characters. But it, it was definitely, there was a transitional period where I, I know at least I was, and I think Danielle was too, where we were definitely trying to figure out who these characters were now. But in a way, I think that's important for a TV show. Like, if you just came out immediately and it was like everything was flawless, it wouldn't be as interesting to watch. That was a good answer. Thank you, thank you. All right, next. Uh, hi, uh, this question is for writer. So, um, uh, I absolutely love the relationship that Sean had with Angela. It was incredible. Uh, so what was it like 
like being, you know, part of one of the first interracial couples showing on a family uh, sitcom. Uh, yeah, so that was it was it was it was interesting because they came to me the, the writers came to me and said we're going to give Sean a serious girlfriend, um, and uh, that you know that was the first time that it ever happened. That was always the you know, and <laughs> so they they brought in they brought in a couple different actresses for me to read with, um, and uh, none of them were white. Um, so that was always a conscious choice on the writer's part because our show was so white. Um, <laughs> and Trina was amazing. And Trina and, Trina and I, we actually did it to audition the girls. They were having them read scenes um, from, a, another, from another episode that we had already done. And I thought, well, we couldn't do any better than when we did it before. And Trina was so good and we just connected. Um, and I think she was an, an incredibly important addition to the show. Um, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, it's like, oh, it, you can look at it as like, oh, she was the token black character. But the result of that was, um, we, you know, our writers had to hire a black female writer. Um, because it was like, they, you know, mostly older white Jewish guys who were like, <laughs> how do we write for this, this young, you know, girl? And, oh, she wasn't much of a young girl, actually. Yeah. She was older than all of us. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> she had like three kids. She, she had three started. kids when she started. Yeah. yeah. She, she was just pregnant. Yeah. She was pregnant. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but they didn't, you know, and, and so you, you saw throughout, you know, we ended up being one of the few shows that had a black writer, let alone a female black writer. And so I think that, you know, it, it, and Trina became an integral part of the show. Um, and it, obviously a big part of our fan base too, you know, I think that people, and there was always this question, we did have conversations, do we address it? Do we talk about it? And... <laughs> Talk about it. And we went back and forth a lot. And, and, and actually, if you could dig it up, um, Trina wrote a um, an editorial for in the LA Times, uh, uh, and she she was on the side of not talking about it um, and not addressing race um, because she felt like we were a model for a younger generation that might be hopefully more colorblind. And I. I, you know, we, we had debates, and I still, am, I'm a little uh, on the fence about it, but it, the reality is people love, the, you know, the character, and they love the love story, and that's what mattered. Um, so, I think it was pretty effective. Hello. Um, so, my question is mostly for um, Will. Um, so, Will, you had a lot of funny moments, so like good looking guy and a lot of funny songs. <laughs> um, was that written in the script or was that mostly you improvising? Most of it was written in the script, um, and then they kind of let me play a little bit. We'd always, Michael and I would either do, he'd do one take, he'd go do one take just the way it is, and then I'd do a will take, or just kind of do whatever you want to do. And then sometimes we'd bet, like he would come up to me and say, we're gonna, we're gonna change this line. And I'd say, no, I can, I can make that funny. And I'd go, no, no, you couldn't. And I'd go, I got a dollar, says I can make that funny. <laughs> and so we'd go out and sometimes he'd flip me a buck and sometimes I'd have to hand him a dollar, but um, we would. We would always do one where we were allowed to play uh, after a while. And that's how we ended up with like the whole couch episode where you know, we couldn't finish the scene because we were just trying to play the whole time. And, and so, yeah, it was, we were certainly allowed to be ourselves, especially in the later years. We were certainly allowed some, some creative movement, which was nice. And uh, I think we capitalized on it where we could, which was kind of a way. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Sean here. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving me a name for a project that I had a while back. <laughs> I, my question is, oh, it's a writer. My, Sean, I hardly knew me. Yeah. <laughs> um, what was probably the favorite episode for each one of you? I think it's the same for all. Except, I mean, yeah. uh, the, the, the horror, the Halloween episode. <laughs> We call it the Scream episode because we were referencing Scream constantly throughout it and, and you know doing all the meta stuff. Yeah, it was just the most fun to shoot. There's actually an oral history of it that somebody wrote. They interviewed a bunch of us, including the writer and um, the creators of the show. And it was just, it's one of the funniest. Yeah. 
Yeah, Manel wrote the episode. He's a big horror film guy who wrote the episode. And I just remember we got the script and we were like, what is going on? <laughs> and then we got in there and it was just the most fun we've ever had. Um, you know, because it was like all the rules were broken. We could say whatever we wanted. We could, you know, and we, it was actually kind of torturous to shoot because we were laughing so hard and they couldn't bring in an audience. And our poor director, Jeff McCracken, hated us so much because we just kept, we couldn't get through a single scene. And if you watch it, you can see we're just always on the verge of breaking. Um, so that was just the most fun to shoot, and I just think it was really a clever, weird episode, and I think that, you know, it's kind of traumatized some kids. Uh, like, people have said, like, the janitor was actually scary, and, what it was, and I, I kind of love that, you know, because it's actually not that scary when you look at it, but I think it's funny that it lodged into people's brains, and I thought that, yeah. I, I remember, um, I was dating Jennifer Love Hewitt at the time, and she came on the episode as Jennifer Love Pfefferman. <laughs> and my, you know, you're, I was like 22, and I was so in love with her, I'm gonna be with her forever, and Mike was like, yeah, okay, whatever. He goes, I, I wanna bring her on the show. I went, okay, great, you know I love her. He's like, yeah, I'm gonna kill her. <laughs> what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm gonna double bookcase on her, I'm gonna kill her. And I was like, okay. about five years later, he goes, I knew you guys had about a month left, so I figured. Let's <laughs> bring her on and double bookcase on her. I was like, okay. <laughs> If I could add to that, I uh, you said one of our favorite episodes. I agree with Ryder about the Scream episode, but I would say one of the most important moments for me on the show was when we filmed our final episode, which I'm yeah. sure you guys have all seen. Or I, if you're here, you've definitely seen it. But um, <laughs> when Mr. Keeney says, dream, try, do good, I just remember that scene. We filmed that scene. That was our final scene of Boy Meets World. And we'd all been together for seven to eight years. And I remember I was like gearing up in my head, like, oh, this is gonna be our final take or our final scene. And we did it once. Yeah. And I remember like, because normally when you're doing a sitcom and you're doing, especially in front of a live audience, you do two or three takes just to make sure you get it. And we did one take and then they said, okay, we're done. And I just remember like having this like moment where it was like, someone was basically saying like, it's, you're, you're done. And, but it was like this moment where you just, like, that's the end of your childhood. So I just, I, re I really have a vivid moment of, like, a memory, like, that exact moment, like, okay, we're moving on. And it, we were just moving on from that scene or that episode. It's like we were moving on from everything, so. You know, Michael wanted, now that he looks back at it, wished we'd done another take. Why is that? Because Danielle has her ponytails open, yeah. and she has a tattoo on her neck. That nobody, that Michael again looked at it later and went like, what, what is that? <laughs> also, there are uh, Bill Daniels goes to shake my hand. Wait, you're wrong. wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but actually, it's a working it because it's like he's trying to be all formal. Yep. I'm bawling my eyes. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I remember we finished that scene and then, so you exit the classroom scene, but they had, there was a wall there. So we were all kind of stuck in this tiny little hallway together looking at each other like, that we're done. Like, it was, yeah. yeah, it was very odd. It was very odd. I mean, on, Thursday night, you're all together and you're doing a show for seven years, and on Friday morning, you wake up and it's cool. Um, it was odd. And that that morning, I had done my last episode of Batman Beyond. So that Thursday, I ended so that was two long. <laughs> it was a good day. I ended two long running series on the same Thursday. That was a tough Thursday night yeah. deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You didn't go out to dinner that night. <laughs> Yeah, that was, I just remember that, all looking at each other, because we didn't know what to say, it's like, we're, that's, that's it, it was weird. But I think when you share that kind of experience with someone, and go through that much, I mean, and this, this is, you know, true of the new kids on the new show, but like with Danielle especially, Ryder Will, like, you go through that experience together, like you trust those people forever, because you just, so that's, I mean, I, Will, Ryder, and I, as soon as we're like back together on the set, or even at a, uh, Comic Con. Uh, it's just, you go right back in your beats, and you go right back and you find the pacing. And it's like so. When they came back on the new show, it was so much fun for me. And it was, I mean, it was just, it was so, it was so great. And when Ryder was directing on the new show, it's like you just immediately, you've known these people so well, and you've gone through so much together that it's like it's just the best way to work with someone because. Ryder like, will be directing, and it's like boom. We don't even. We just know what, what each other's going to say before we even need to say it. So. You guys mentioned William Daniels there, and it is his 91st birthday today, so happy birthday, Mr. Kagan. Yeah. Uh, what, what was it like to work with Bill? What was it like to work with Bill? It was amazing. Um, he could be a stern taskmaster without ever raising his voice. He did everything with a look. He would never talk down to us. Um, William Daniels is a, an old school actor. 
stage actor, film actor. So it didn't matter that Ben was 11 or Ryder was 12 or I was 16. It didn't matter. You're actors. Um, you know, I'm not going to treat you like you're a little kid. You're here to do a job and you're going to do a job. Um, that's not to say you couldn't have a ton of fun with Bill. And we would absorb every story that he told us. Um, but I think we loved him and even more when we found out that he was the voice of Kid Night Rider. <laughs> that's when we were like, what? <laughs> Emmy Awards for St. Elsewhere, huh? Night Rider! <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. Um, also, when you're, whenever I would have a scene with uh, Bill on Boy Meets World, and Girl Meets World, he also came back. Uh, you really elevate your performance, because like Will was saying, he's really an old school actor, but he's very professional, and he really is on top of it. So I remember when we would have these scenes in Mr. Feeney's backyard together, and I was 11 or 12 years old, I always was, you know, you really elevate your performance, you really want to step it up, because you don't want to disappoint him, and you want, you know, I just remember always enjoying my scenes with him. Nice guy, too. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, these guys covered. I mean, Bill was amazing, and yeah, it was, it, for me, it was I, a Night Rider was the only thing I knew him from. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, like these guys said, he he would, he, you know, when you're on a sitcom, they're always rewriting the script every night. Um, and so what that means is you don't memorize your script because it takes too much work because they're going to rewrite it anyway. Bill never carried a script. He would come on set having memorized the entire thing every day before he walked onto set. And it was just like this never level made. of like theatrical training that he just could not get away from and he didn't want to. He wanted to be on set rehearsing with us. It was like a finished performance from the moment he walked onto set. It was just like this crazy old school approach. I, mean, I think he's been acting since he was a kid. Like he was like five or something so, yeah. on Broadway. So he's just... And, and then also his wife Bonnie, who was on our show a few times as well, is just like, again like the nicest person in the world. And yeah, happy birthday! Ninety-one. Wow, happy birthday! So when I'm ninety-one, <laughs> oh, you trying to do the math? You got a while. We'll be here. <laughs> Next. All right. So you guys have mentioned how you were on the show during very formative years of your life. So I'm sure it was a huge learning experience for all of you. So I'm just curious, what would you say is the most valuable lesson you learned through your experience with the show? <laughs> you mean just one? Just I one. mean, just sort of the Orish War, whatever. <laughs> I learned to not join a cult. <laughs> Important safety tip. No, I mean, for, you know, for me, because, you know, writing and directing now, uh, I, we had like a front row seat to, you know, it was like film school at 13 started for me, you know, the, the everybody was top-notch professional and, um, you know, in the case of Michael Jacobs in particular, um, learning things about comedy, learning things about uh, story, and, uh, you know, like, just, for example, I mean, we, we make fun of Michael all the time because he's the kind of guy who would be like, you know, if we, we, he would, if, you, if you're giving me ba da ba da ba, I want ba da ba da ba, and like he would have this like obsessive obsessions with like rhythm and how lines are delivered. But um, you know, if you actually talk to him about it, he'd be like, look, uh, uh, comedy is music, and if you really look at like the, the best, uh, the best comedians are also always musicians. And you know Woody Allen, um, uh, Steve Martin, Steve Martin, and, and he's right. You know, and he has this. He has. It's kind of old school, but it's really good advice. And he would, um, he would constantly be giving us that kind of, uh, those kind of, uh, that knowledge. And I use it all the time in my own writing and uh, in directing and other stuff now. And uh, so for me, like, just in general, like, it was film school. It was amazing, and I'm so fortunate to have had that. I think also in addition to the technical stuff um, and the experience from the writers, I mean, I think that the themes of Boy Meets World, I learned a lot from the themes. And uh, I mean, there's some uh, really wonderful mantras and themes behind the show. And it, but, so you're, I guess it's hard for us because you're saying what was one lesson you learned. I mean, I learned something new every week. And uh, what I think is interesting is as you get older, your perspective on the episodes change. So viewing an episode when I was 13 or 14, obviously, when you go back at 24, you have a different perspective. When you go back at 34, you have a different perspective. Because your life has changed, so the lessons changed. Um, That's true, yeah. I, I, from a professional standpoint, I, I think I learned as a comedic actor that the best thing you can do is commit 100% to every joke. Just throw yourself into it, the deep end, and if it's funny, it'll be there and see what happens. 
From a personal side, I learned never to park in Ben Savage's spot. <laughs> that was an important lesson uh, and one I've taken with me. That's important. Also, restaurants really want you to take roles. Yeah. They want you to take roles. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, next. So this question is for Elle. Can you still do the PD call? I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. I can still do the PD call, but I don't do the PD call anymore. And here there's a reason. It was handed to the girls on Girl Meets World, and I passed the torch. Um, very quick story, I was doing a show called Thundercats, and, thank you, and Larry Kenny, who was the original Lion-O, was doing the Thundercats ho, and he was at a convention, and they said, will you do the Thundercats ho? He said, I'll do it one more time, and then I'm passing it on to Will. So I went to the set of Girl Meets World, and I did it in front of the audience one more time, and I passed it to the girls. So it's officially theirs now. You're going to have to ask them. Okay. We can call them. We can call them. Hello. I just want to thank you all for being here, first of all, because I grew up with you guys, and I watched the show every what was it, Friday night, TGIF. And it's really cool seeing you all here. And just to move away from the show, I'm going to ask some, some things about you. Um, these conventions are a lot about fandom. What would you say is something that you're really into, that, a fandom that you're really all about? <laughs> I can go, I can go. <laughs> um, so I love Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I host a show about painting miniature figures, which is a ton of fun. And uh, I am a voracious fantasy novel reader. So that's, I've got three very, I let my nerd flag fly and I'm happy to do it. So, uh, yeah, huge nerd and lover. I literally have a D20 in my pocket right now, just yeah. in case anybody wants to roll. So that's, don't ever go anywhere unarmed, especially in a con. So, I got my D20, yeah. That's mine. <laughs> That's my, my favorite. Like, I just think it's it was so well written, and um, 
Uh, yeah, it was it was super fun. I mean, we were just like, uh, it was kind of creepy how the how much the makeup like they did these things. They put stuff on my face to like pull my face back a little bit, <laughs> and like the makeup and the art. It was just the craziest experience to look in the mirror and be like, oh, I'm like a woman now. Um, and I was also only like 15, you know. You're still kind of like, oh, I didn't know this was possible. Um, and and I remember at the time I wasn't super stoked because people kept saying like, you're actually really beautiful, Ryder. And I was like, oh, God, come on. Uh, so yeah, at the time I remember not being super stoked on it. But then like Ben and I were just goofing around and like, we we, we have some photos that we took on our own. Uh, well, very funny. Uh, we were in the full girl outfits. Uh, but no, I, I love that episode, and and, it, and it's it's definitely held up. And turned, yeah, it was kind of like a pre Me Too Me Too moment. Uh, so it's, it's a great episode. Very proud of that. Also, I think just to touch on thematically, I think that the lessons do hold up because they're kind of timeless lessons. Um, you know, I think one of the most important lessons that we learned from the show is love conquers all, I think. Um, <laughs> but I think more importantly, it's about, you know, going, um, following your heart. And I think that was a lesson I learned on Boy Meets World, Girl Meets World. And I think that's, you know, it's important to leave yourself vulnerable. It's important to, you know, go for your dreams and it's important to follow your heart. And it, they sound a little generic and, you know, but, but they're really, they are important themes. So I think the, the lessons we touched on in the show, I mean, I think they are timeless. I uh, also dressed like a woman, but it was for more of a comedy one. <laughs> Nobody said, wow, you look really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it did not happen. <laughs> Hey guys, um, so first off I want to say thank you for building up my childhood. Uh, I grew up with uh, Boy Meets World and to put it into perspective, my dad hates TV, just period. Uh, and he didn't even sit down and still watch Boy Meets World with me. So, um, That's awesome. Yeah, uh, my question for all you guys is, uh, of course with any TV show or uh, whether it was TGIF or anything, um, is that they, there's usually like mishaps or mistakes or little improvisations that go on. Um, is there anything that stuck that was sort of like a mishap or something that, you know, didn't click as well, but it still somehow did, and then it just kind of stuck with the show, and the writers kind of was like, okay, we'll stick with that. You know, you know what the most interesting one is? Is that Danielle was not the original Topanga. Um, there was another uh, another girl hired to be uh, Topanga, and um, she was much more the sort of, like, Danielle, you know, Danielle was in person at the time, but she was 11 years old, and she was from uh, the Valley in LA, and she talked really fast, and she, you know, she was like this little Valley girl, yeah. and um, she was cast as a secondary part, she had like two lines, and um, the other girl was much more sort of the way Topanga was originally, like, you know, this sort of out there hippie, dippy, um, but it wasn't working out, like, uh, it was just not, it was, she was not right for the part, it wasn't gelling, and, and so, ha like, halfway through the, the week, Michael Jacobs was like, we need to find somebody else to play Topanga, and it was just like, that girl there, and Danielle came, came, came back to the show um, with her hair all frizzed out the way it did, and she like trained herself to speak, and it's very slow, you know. And when we did that scene with the, you know, with the makeup and lipstick, it was just like, oh, this is the show, like this is, and this love between these two characters, like in the way that she can change Corey and you know expand his world was like, oh, well, this is. And, I think that, you know, that was never intended. <laughs> like that was not. That was supposed to be like a one-off episode about Corey. You know, his he strangers hair and he meets some crazy. And in that same episode, I was supposed to be. I only had two lines. Um, and I, you know, I, I had a very small part of it until that episode. And we'd always been trying to have a third best friend. Yeah, sure. And we called it the death chair in the cafeteria because they we kept getting. If you watch the first like five episodes, there's always another guy, and then yeah. he's gone the next week. Yeah. And and, 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 and so that episode, they fired that kid too, oh. and gave me all of his lines. So I ended up being the character that helps Corey straighten his hair. I ended up being the one that says, "Use a mirror, babe," and like all these sort of iconic things just clicked in one episode, and so it became, you know, the Corey Sean friendship was solidified in that one episode, yeah. and Dan, you know, Topanga and Corey's love became solidified. So if you think about it, like that one episode was full of the weirdest mistakes or the, you know, miscastings that led to the, the entire show. Um, so that's a, the easiest answer. Thank you.